In 2001, Rockstar Games released Grand Theft Auto 3, a title that would define what action-adventure sandbox games would be for years to come. While the first two GTA games had been a success, GTA 3 became the best-selling game of the year, garnering critical acclaim and giving the series instant notoriety and infamy inside and outside the gaming circle. A major factor behind its success was the open world, one of the first of its kind, creating an entire fictional city to explore in Liberty City. It would inspire the creation of several games that provided players with large environments to explore, missions to tackle, and activities to partake in when they wanted a break. Usually, these games place you in the role of a criminal, giving players freedom to commit devastatingly violent acts as part of the gameplay. But ten years after their first smash hit, Rockstar published a game that examined things from the other side of the equation. 2011 saw the release of a game set in 1940s Los Angeles, where players took the role of a detective climbing the ranks of the LAPD, solving crimes, busting down gangs and mobs, and interrogating witnesses and suspects. And while it didn't focus as much on the freedom of the GTA games, it still delivered a well-received narrative, a unique spin on the sandbox gameplay, and a fully realized recreation of the time period and setting. It also holds a special place in my heart, being the first M-rated game I ever played, and being my introduction to sandbox games and the GTA series. But does it still hold up ten years after its launch? That's what we're about to find out. This is L.A. Noir. The story of L.A. Noir starts in mid-2003 with Brendan McNamara, a former developer at the Soho whose directing credits included the PS2 British gangster title The Getaway, who left to form his own video game studio in Sydney, Australia named Team Bondi. The company's first game, L.A. Noir, was announced in July 2005 as a PlayStation 3 title to be published by Sony Computer Entertainment. The game would immerse players into the world of 1947 Los Angeles, and to achieve this setting, Team Bondi poured heavy attention into researching the real-life time period and location. To that end, McNamara, the game's director and writer, read over 1,000 newspapers from 1947 in the LA City archives to get inspiration from news stories of real-life crime cases. To create the game's characters, Team Bondi and its sister company, Depth Analysis, employed a new face-scanning technology called Motion Scan. This elaborate camera system, an innovation at the time, allowed for high detailed capturing of facial movements, a critical point since a big crux of L.A. Noir is determining whether or not a character is lying to you. While L.A. Noir was originally a PS3 exclusive under Sony Computer Entertainment, it was later announced that Rockstar Games would publish the game instead, bringing the game to the Xbox 360 and PC, and initially projected for release in Rockstar's fiscal year 2008. The game wouldn't actually launch until May 2011, but when it did hit store shelves, it received mostly positive reviews from critics and fans, and sold well enough to be a success for Rockstar. It was lauded for its storytelling, commitment to the setting, and intriguing detective gameplay, and it was even honored as an official selection at the 2011 Tribeca Film Festival, the first video game to do so. While it was initially released for the PS3 and Xbox 360, and later PC, in 2011, a remastered version was launched for next-gen consoles in 2017, releasing with all the DLC and pre-order bonuses included. But why did L.A. Noir take so long to develop in the first place? The answer was revealed shortly after the game came out in a series of news stories beginning with the release of LANoirCredits.com. This was a website created by former Team Bondi employees that contained a list of 130 developers whose names were removed from the game's credits despite elements of their work remaining in the final product. And not long after the website went public, an article in the Sydney Morning Herald and an expose on IGN revealed the horrible working conditions at Team Bondi and its treatment of employees. These stories, containing insights from former Team Bondi developers, demonstrated how the company existed in a nearly consistent state of crunch time, with poor management overseeing everything. Employees often worked 12-hour workdays, including weekends without overtime pay, in a harsh and abusive working environment, with McNamara exerting complete control over changes to the game. 
Part of the problem was that McNamara would speak to developers directly rather than going through the team leads, contributing to the micromanagement issues that Team Bondi's management suffered from. Employee turnaround rates were very high, putting pressure on the remaining employees to pick up the work of those who had left, and throughout Ellie Noir's production, development was never going well. In response to the allegations, the International Game Developers Association launched an investigation into Team Bondi to determine the spread of the company's issues. And soon after this story dropped, Team Bondi developers came forward with some leaked emails that showed how the relationship between Rockstar and Team Bondi had been shattered. Rockstar held Bondi and McNamara in contempt because of their poor management style, while conversely, Bondi management were frustrated that Rockstar took away their creative control. According to developers, Rockstar shot down a lot of ideas that were considered too insane by both the publisher and Bondi's developers, and Rockstar's team even came in to assist in development wherever possible. It's likely that Rockstar was doing this because they were sinking a lot of money into marketing the game, and perhaps intervened in development to help protect their investment. Some developers commented that Rockstar was at one point looking to turn Team Bondi into a Rockstar subsidiary, but after seeing their managerial problems, decided against this idea. Because of these issues, Rockstar refused to work with Team Bondi after LNOI was released, and without a publisher, they were left on their own to survive. And survive, they did not. The company was shut down four months after L.A. Noir launched, with the studio's assets being sold to George Miller's production company, Kennedy Miller Mitchell, which also brought on Team Bondi staff. By the time it closed, Team Bondi still owed 1.4 million Australian dollars to its former employees and creditors, effectively ending any hope that the company would reform. Obviously, the conditions at Team Bondi were terrible, and I know I focused a lot on that while discussing the development, but it's an important thing to contextualize up front before getting into the game. Crunch is a huge problem in the gaming industry, and LNOR is not the first and only example of a game with troubling development, but seeing as how Team Bondi's administration caused it to cease operations just after its first game came out, it's an interesting case to study ten years later. If you're new to this channel, rest assured that I don't judge the quality of a game on the circumstances of its development or developer, but to completely ignore talking about it would be a disservice. With that said, let's now actually dive into the game and see how its ambitious gameplay ideas and lofty narrative design hold up after 10 years. L.A. Noir begins in 1947 with police officer Cole Phelps, a former U.S. Marine who quickly makes a name for himself in the Los Angeles Police Department thanks to his intuition and track record. After apprehending a murder suspect and conducting the interrogation that gets them convicted, Phelps is promoted to the rank of detective. With his new position, Phelps begins investigating cases that take place across Los Angeles, uncovering a number of crime rings and conspiracies while dealing with corruption inside the police force and malevolent organizations and individuals that seek to rule over the city. On the base gameplay level, L.A. Noir isn't too different from any other sandbox game with third-person shooter controls, and anyone familiar with GTA will instantly recognize the similarities. Outside of action scenes, though, you can't pull out your gun unless you're prompted by the game, so you can't cause rampant chaos on a whim as you're on the side of the law this time. But that becomes a different story once Phelps gets behind the wheel. These cars control decently enough, but at high speeds, it becomes difficult to make precise turns without mastering the handbrake and drifting. But inevitably, either because of impatience or other circumstances, you'll crash into another car, an object on the street, or, god forbid, a person. And I don't know what it is, but these collisions are absolutely fantastic to watch unfold. There's something about the way the game's physics engine handles the crashes that make them a sight to behold. If you want to avoid that, however, you can have your partner drive for you, which will skip right to your destination after autoplaying any dialogue, which is almost necessary if you want to get a good rating on each case. The main portion of the gameplay revolves around examining crime scenes, finding clues, and talking to witnesses and suspects. Crime Scene Investigation tasks players with observing a cordoned off area and examining any noteworthy objects, or in most cases, bodies. When Phelps gets near something he can examine, he can investigate it further to determine what it is and either put together or theorize how it relates to the case. Some items you simply need to look at, while others require more examination, either done with the press of a button or by moving it around in Phelps' hands, which reveals previously unseen details. 
Anything noteworthy will be jotted down in your notebook, and you can view your list of clues and persons of interest at any time to be reminded of all the evidence and key people slash locations involved in the case. The interview sequences are absolutely the highlight of the game, as they're the logical climax of the game's mysteries that often connects vital evidence to the case and reveals the truth behind what happened. Phelps has a list of questions for every important person in the case, and upon receiving the answer, you need to determine whether or not the person is lying by listening to their tone of voice and examining their body and facial language. You can respond to their statements via three options, truth, doubt, and lie, and yes, the remastered version changes the options to good cop, bad cop, and accuse, but I'll be referring to the old system for this video. Truth lets Phelps gently try to bring more information out of the witness, while Doubt sees Phelps getting forceful when the person is trying to hide the truth to make them buckle under pressure. Lie, however, is for when you have evidence that the witness isn't being honest, and to call them out, you need to present the right clues to discredit their statement. The interviewee will elaborate more on the question if you choose the right option, but selecting the wrong choice causes them to either successfully sneak a lie past you or clam up and refuse to say more about the subject. Instead of just being given the information needed to explain the story and advance the game, Eleanor makes you work for the answers by tying the evidence to your questioning. It's a great way to organically provide knowledge to the player and introduce new elements to the case, and really put you in the mind of a detective since you need to make the logical connections necessary to properly question someone. I do think some of these answers require a bit too much lateral thinking to figure out, as it's only clear what the connection is after you get the answer right, but these instances are thankfully few and far between. And though the interrogations provide an abundance of narrative thrills and shocking twists, they're counterbalanced by a healthy serving of action sequences that ramp up the intensity and danger. From shootouts to fistfights and chases, Ellie Noir gives us a very decent spread of more mindless activities that serve as a nice contrast and break from the intellectual side of the game. Shooting sections are a common one, but these segments are hampered by awkward movement quirks that make it difficult to get into cover, which can spell trouble if you're up against a mook armed with bigger artillery. It usually isn't too bad, but when you're in an area without a lot of obvious cover spots, don't be surprised if Phelps ends up taking a fall. Then there's the brawling, which is decidedly less life-threatening, but also a lot more tedious and uninteresting. Combat boils down to simple button pressing here, and while you do need good timing, there's no natural rhythm, and the punching just doesn't have a lot of impact, though the headbutting certainly does. When you have a suspect cornered and make it clear you're there to arrest them, they'll often choose to flee, making you give chase. The on-foot chases aren't that exciting, but car chases are incredibly fun, if sometimes frustrating because of the driving issues I mentioned earlier. When you are able to keep up with the suspect, it's very invigorating trying to disable their car or letting your partner shoot out their tires. But it isn't always about relentlessly pursuing the suspect, because occasionally, you'll need to carefully tail someone so they can lead you to a location without them knowing. These are a test of patience, as when you're tailing in a car, you must drive carefully and not get too close or too far away from the person's car. That's not too bad most of the time, but I have a hard time completing the on-foot tails because I try to rush it or because the suspect has laser precision eyesight that recognizes you by the edge of your hat. Phelps gains experience points by finding clues, answering interview questions correctly, and completing side content, increasing his rank to unlock optional goodies like extra outfits, hidden cars, and intuition points. Intuition points give players a hint on what to do next by either revealing all the clues at a location, asking what other players selected for interview answers, or by removing a choice from the interviews altogether. It's a good way to help out newcomers, especially when interview questions get much harder and the logic isn't as clear, but you only have a limited amount of points to work with, so paying close attention to difficult questions pays off in the long run. L.A. Noir is separated into multiple cases, and Phelps gets a rating on a scale of 1 to 5 stars based on how well he did, including clues found, questions answered correctly, and damages caused to L.A. and its people. Other than getting all the answers right, the easiest way to get 5 stars for every case is by having your partner drive, because at least then you won't be causing any damages to the city. It's certainly possible to get 5 stars doing all the driving yourself, but to avoid dealing with the sometimes unpredictable driving from LA citizens, having your partner take the wheel is always the safer option. As Phelps rises through the ranks of the LAPD, he gets assigned to different desks in the force, each of which covers a different section of police work. 
While the general gameplay doesn't change across desks, the more abstract techniques are different because each desk has its own perspectives and methodologies to consider. For example, traffic and arson cases focus more on the physical cause and effect that led to a crime, while homicide is more concerned with a suspect's motive, and vice follows supply lines and chains of command to bust high-level crime ranks. Naturally, cases become more difficult the further you are in the game, with much more elaborate setups and a larger amount of investigation required as the acts you look into become more and more intricate and complex. On every desk, you're assigned a partner who helps investigate crime scenes, provide context for clues and leads, assist in apprehending suspects, and banters with Phelps about the current case, the state of the LAPD, or other random things. They, alongside the actual cases, provide the flavor of each desk, since it's primarily through their eyes that you initially see what working as a detective entails as Phelps learns the ropes of each department. The tutorial section, Patrol, shows Phelps in his police officer days taking street crimes and handling basic cases and misdemeanors. These cases aren't ranked, as they're merely here to teach the player about investigations and interviews, as well as driving, shooting, and chasing suspects, with no real complicated stories. Phelps' partner here is Ralph Dunn, a fellow officer whom we don't know too much about since we only see him for a short time, though we know he's at least competent at his job and enjoys making the occasional jab. Shooter put him up against the wall and blew his brains out. Hell of a way to go. Doesn't really matter how you go once you're gone. <laughs> Don't get all deep on me, Phelps. He doesn't have the same intuition and get-go as Phelps, but he is at least willing to go along with Phelps' instinct to the extent that it falls within the scope of their roles as police officers. Upon his promotion to detective, Phelps' first assignment is the Traffic Desk, which deals with automotive-based crimes, including hit-and-runs, automobile theft, and suspicious car accidents. Immediately, the cases are more intense, including an abandoned car with an interior soaked in blood, a stolen car that was apparently sold legitimately, and a hit-and-run that turns into a murder case. Already, Eleanor gives us a sense of intrigue that will only intensify as the game progresses, guiding the player through the mystery of what happened and stringing them along with unclear or false leads until it eventually reveals what actually happened. Helping you along the way is Stefan Bukowski, a man very similar to Ralph Dunn in that he occasionally likes to crack wise at Phelps' expense, but comes to treat Phelps in both a professional and friendly light. This is your first case, Phelps. It's okay to admit it if you're stumped. If you don't know what to do next, just come talk to me and we'll see what we can figure out. Thanks, Stefan. You're okay. Bukowski's experience gives him a knowledge of police procedure and a desire to see a case through to the end, even if he isn't always grateful to be given the work he gets. Though he's initially a little rude, it's likely from a place of jealousy seeing Phelps move up so fast, and once he gets over it, the two treat each other with respect and get along well as partners. The next desk, Homicide, sees Phelps tackle a series of murders of young women left on display in public areas, and unlike Traffic, whose cases are all unconnected, Homicide's cases form a whole story in and of themselves based on the story of the Black Dahlia. The Black Dahlia refers to the murder of Elizabeth Short, a real-life case that happened in 1947 which remains unsolved to this day. The event has inspired a number of fictional media because of its mystery and lack of closure, and L.A. Noir presents its own version with its unique answer as to who the Black Dahlia Killer was. As a fictional story, it's an interesting look at the media attention the real case received and how strictly the LAPD tried to control internal and external interest in the case to keep a lid on it as it was developing. But I find it less effective as a murder mystery because the case structure makes each individual victim Phelps comes across seem less relevant to the story of the Black Dahlia and more important in their own case, and the suspects we apprehend are introduced too quickly. I do like the final homicide case where Phelps chases and eventually corners the killer after a days long search, a case that features no interviews, instead having Phelps solve puzzles left by the killer via excerpts from the poem Prometheus Unbound to figure out where he's hiding. It's a fitting end to the saga, one that shows Phelps' intellectual side and native detective instinct kicked into full gear as he hunts down a murderer. Rusty Galloway is your partner on this desk, and he immediately marks himself as a less friendly type than Dunn and Mikowski, upfront telling Phelps that he doesn't like being his partner and not being willing to put up with Phelps' assertions that the murders are connected. It's not that Galloway is a bad detective, as when he sees that something fits, he will pursue the lead accordingly, but at the same time, he isn't one to connect the dots if doing so requires a ton of effort. 
Galloway is lazy and irritable, and he and Phelps rub each other the wrong way on many occasions, sometimes making for some entertaining banter. Burglar used a pry bar. Why did you kick the door in? You think I'm gonna climb through a broken window in a $30 suit? You got another thing coming, Buster. Administrative Vice is the penultimate desk that sees Phelps transfer to the Hollywood police station, and his investigations put him into contact with a number of more high-profile people in Los Angeles. Vice deals with crimes like narcotics distribution, prostitution, racketeering, and organized crime, including a huge supply of army surplus morphine lifted off a military cargo ship, and it first appears to be a more glamorous job than other LAPD departments. However, the cases in this game reveal not only the real depravity that these criminals commit, but also how corrupt the Vice Squad is and how they let obviously guilty men slide because of the kickbacks they get. It's not an area that Phelps feels comfortable in, especially as events in the story cause his career to come to an abrupt halt because of the corruption he's trying to fight. Nowhere is that more apparent than in his vice partner, Roy Earl, a crooked cop and all-around bastard who just radiates bad energy. It's evident that Roy is a terrible, corrupt person, showing his ego when Phelps first meets him and later claiming that doling out vices like drugs and sex to people in high positions is part of their jobs as cops. The truth is, everyone wants the license to get a little dirty now and then. Our job is to keep it manageable. That's how you see it? See it any other way and you better forget about being a vice cop. Can we get on with this today, preferably? In many ways, Earl is the exact opposite of Phelps, a tactless and uncaring individual who plays into the corruption of the system rather than fighting against it because it gives him power over others. He also plays a key role in the main narrative as a force working to stop Phelps from pursuing his investigations. More on that later. The final desk in the game is arson, and as you might guess, this desk is concerned with investigating fires and not much else, basically the bottom of the LAPD totem pole. There's a general feeling of misery and apathy in this desk, not just because of the reason Phelps lands this desk, but because working on arson for so long makes a person feel worn out and uninterested in what they're doing. In fact, the real meat of arson isn't even focused on fires, but on a major scandal that requires Phelps to confront his past and accept responsibility for the actions he took during the war. Phelps' partner on arson is Herschel Biggs, and he's my favorite partner because of his character growth as he teams up with Phelps. Biggs initially dismisses Phelps, claiming that his suspicions surrounding the fires are just a ploy to satisfy his ego and put him back in good standing with his superiors. There's no percentage in this. I think it's more than one case. There are house fires, coal, accidents, heater fires, gas explosions. There's got to be a reason. The reason is you want to be a star again. Forget it. Give it up. You'll feel better. But Biggs is dealing with his own trauma, having previously served as a Marine during World War I, where he witnessed his unit burn to death inside a barn during the Battle of Belo Wood. After Biggs starts seeing the same connections that Phelps does, he becomes more approachable and even respects Phelps for continuing to chase the conspiracy, even when external pressure tries to get him to stop. By the end of the game, he's a loyal ally to Phelps, and seeing that transformation is absolutely wonderful. As the name implies, L.A. Noir places a lot of attention into recreating 1940s Los Angeles to be as historically accurate as possible, but also to provide a setting that would feel engrossing for the game's story. Recurring characters help make the LAPD feel like a real organization, such as Coroner Malcolm Carruthers and Technical Services Investigator Ray Pinker, based on a real-life forensic scientist of the same name. These two provide him with information on the case and occasionally add their own analysis into what's happening to either give Phelps a different angle or just to provide their own little character moments. And the other characters paint the larger picture of a post-war Los Angeles struggling to deal with corruption in the police force and increasing crime rates, showing the effects these have on the population. Not to mention the city map itself is gargantuan, spreading across three distinct police sections of Los Angeles, Central, Hollywood, and Wilshire. Team Bondi dedicated a lot of effort to researching post-war LA and crafting a version of it that feels as sprawling and unique as the real thing, with the photography of Robert Spence in particular being a huge influence. Each district has its own feel to it, with Central featuring a lot of compact street design and taller buildings, Wilshire being more suburban and rural, and Hollywood having a more open skyline. And given how wide the map is, it's safe to say that you'd be lost without the mini-map to guide you, especially since the street layout doesn't always make it easy to get from one place to another. 
That's one of the reasons why the free roam mode Streets of LA exists, a standalone mode for each desk that lets you drive around Los Angeles to explore and pick up any missed street crimes. Street crimes involve Phelps responding to a dispatch call and stopping whatever's happening at the scene, and while the stories for these missions aren't always interesting, it is sometimes fun to see characters from previous cases reappear in different circumstances than Phelps left them. In addition, the developers also throw in a bunch of hidden stuff for players to find if they know where to look, the most important of which are the newspapers, which you can find at crime scenes during cases. While these are technically optional, the newspapers show cutscenes that reveal important plot details or events happening to other characters as Phelps is on a case, giving an outside perspective on the overarching narrative that gives players the fuller picture. Players can also discover several landmarks around the city, each of which is based on a real historic location in Los Angeles, and some of which can be explored to varying degrees, which is a nice touch. By locating garages around town, Phelps can unlock hidden vehicles, some of which are pretty sweet. There are nearly 100 vehicles in the game that you can drive, also based on real world cars, and while collecting all of them can be a pain, I'll admit I find a certain pleasure in finding a vehicle I haven't unlocked yet. LA Noir also features collectibles that will have you searching the far corners of the map to find the smallest pathways and side routes possible. Golden film reels named after films of the era, police badges initially part of a pre-order bonus and DLC pack, and, exclusive to the remastered edition, golden records and novels. Keep in mind that these are relatively tiny items compared to the game map, many of which are tucked away in a tiny corner that makes finding every single one without any assistance basically a miracle. L.A. Noir is already rich in content, and it didn't need these collection quests to beef it up, especially since the only reward besides achievement is experience, something you'll be getting plenty of anyway. But what helps make traveling through the urban jungle of L.A. so absorbing in this game is the atmosphere. When you set a story in a real setting, often the best way to evoke the time and location is to capture the specific details that made that place unique. It isn't enough for the setting to just look like what it's recreating, it needs to feel like it too, or else it might feel like a cheap facsimile, which L.A. Noir's world absolutely does not. The music especially helps in this regard, with both an in-game radio station that includes actual songs, newsreels, and comedy shows of the era, and an original soundtrack that plays during cutscenes and action sequences composed by brothers Simon and Andrew Hale. These songs epitomize noir jazz goodness, switching between somber melodies and high-octane romps to suit the current scene, complete with a full jazz orchestra providing an auditory snapshot of America in the 1940s. This soundtrack is one of the most defining aesthetical aspects of L.A. Noir, and was so well done that it won the BAFTA Video Game Award for Best Original Soundtrack in 2012. I have to shout out the Hales for their work, alongside German singer Claudia Bruken for providing wonderful vocals for three songs. Everything from the color choices, to the architecture, to the clothing, to the accents helps sell the location of 1940s L.A., if the narrative beats and premise didn't do so already. There's even the option to view the game in black and white, which is a simple yet charming way to emulate films of the era without sacrificing visual fidelity or the player's view. It might seem like a simple filter, but keep in mind that color and lighting are very important for media shot in black and white, so it's impressive that both the color and monochrome view properly highlight areas of interest. The model quality is good for the time period, with plenty of detail to help characters stand apart, but it's the animations that I want to highlight since they were built up so much in the marketing. Motion Scan does capture all the small nuances in a person's face as they speak, and even 10 years later, the movements are still very impressive. That's not just a credit to Motion Scan, though, but also to the actors delivering subtle facial cues that indicate their characters' feelings and emotions even when they're trying to mask them with what they're saying. However, some of the seams have begun to reveal themselves because while the motion scan face captures are very impressive, how they're put together with everything else isn't always perfect. 
Because lines were recorded individually, the game loads different animations between dialogue, interrogation faces, and idle animations, and the transitions into new animations sometimes look unnatural. This is sort of difficult to get across without playing the game for yourself, but if you're paying attention to how a face molds into an expression once a character finishes talking, you'll see what I mean. A common criticism when the game came out was that while the faces were lively and expressive, the body animations felt stiff and robotic. The bodies weren't captured using motion scan, so they were inevitably going to be poorer as a result, and in many cases, I just think the body animations look stiff by comparison, and not on their own. And I find it's easy to overlook these problems because the acting usually makes up for the animation quirks. The actors do a good job on the whole, and while I already mentioned the physical motion capture, the voice performances are also a highlight, especially from the main cast. Aaron Stanton wonderfully plays Cole Phelps as a hard-working yet uptight detective who is alternatively comforting, humorous, cynical, or confrontational depending on who he's talking to. I'm tired of your shtick, Morgan. Spill it! Or we take you out in the alley and we knock it out of you! Phelps can go from calm and collected to screaming and intimidating within seconds, but he never goes too far with anyone unless they deserve it, and he always delivers a commanding presence when he speaks. The rest of the cast is also a treat, especially John Noble as Leland Monroe, Keith Zarabashka as Herschel Biggs, and Adam Harrington as Roy Earl. Interestingly, many of the game's cast all acted together in the AMC show Mad Men, likely because Mad Men's casting directors Carrie Audino and Laura Schiff also provided casting direction for L.A. Noir. The two share over 70 actors in both major and minor roles, but even the non-Mad Men actors give generally good performances. But now we come to the story of L.A. Noir, one of its core aspects and a large reason in determining if the game is still worth playing. It's clear that Team Bondi took care in creating a story that takes the audience on a bunch of twists and turns, complete with dramatic reveals and in-depth characters, but while the narrative is impressive in its scale, it's time we analyze how well the story itself is told. I won't be covering the plot of every case, instead focusing on the overall story and the character of Phelps and his progression over the game. One of the most critical aspects in understanding Phelps is to look at his actions during the war, revealed to us in flashbacks between various cases. Phelps signed up for the Marine Corps Officer Candidate School, where he met fellow Officer Candidate Jack Kelso, and the two did not get along, as Kelso hated Phelps' attitude and obsession with glory as a Marine. The two bickered constantly, and Phelps wasn't above sliding Kelso whenever he got the chance, which on one occasion gets Kelso into trouble when Phelps gives him bad marks for leadership. Kelso eventually dropped out of OCS to join a rifle company, rising through the ranks to become a sergeant, while Phelps graduated and became a lieutenant, giving him the status he was yearning for. Seeing the younger Phelps go through officer training, we can see a lot of Phelps' flaws shining through, much more noticeably because he doesn't yet have the experiences that will humble him. Phelps isn't just fighting because he believes in his country, but because he sees the war as an opportunity to make a name for himself, and this drives a wedge between him and Kelso, as he sees Phelps as only out here for the merit and not for his duties as a soldier. They talk about officers like you in boot camp, Cole. They call it the Custer Syndrome. Guys who go around dreaming of fame and glory and getting all of their men killed in the process. Our duty is to lead, Kelso. And their duty is to die for your wonderful future? This is a rivalry that continued throughout the war, as Kelso and Phelps would cross paths as they fought in the Okinawa campaign, and the two had varying degrees of both leadership style and leadership success. Kelso, being more trained as a soldier, had a better understanding of what his fellow troops were going through and thus was able to relate to them, commanding them well and gaining their respect. Phelps, on the other hand, was less concerned with assessing the situation as a soldier and insisted on doing everything by the book, even when it wasn't efficient or necessary to do so. This often resulted in scorn and disapproval from his unit, with other soldiers openly insulting him and calling him bad luck, including Courtney Sheldon, a field medic known for his almost suicidal bravery. Even though Phelps was following what he was taught in OCS, his strict adherence to it not only gained him no respect, but ironically made him sloppy at his job since he would often fall behind by being so methodical. Through his wartime experiences, we see the flaws in Phelps' character, his ego, his inability to take suggestions from others, and his hubris. But interestingly, the qualities that earned Phelps no favors during the war is what we like about him as a detective. 
As a detective, we admire Phelps for sticking to the law and not giving in to the corruption that's spreading within the organization. He wants to do things the right way, not the quick and easy way, and it's fascinating how those both brought him commendation and condemnation at different points in his life. Later flashbacks show Phelps at his worst, as his unit, the 6th Marines, is reassigned to fight on Sugarloaf Hill, where they suffered heavy casualties, sending Phelps into shock and making him unable to fight. He survived through the night and was given a promotion and the Silver Star for his bravery, though both Phelps and Kelso knew that he didn't deserve it and Phelps would be tormented by his guilt after the war. Sometime after this, Phelps is given orders to destroy enemy caves to cut off their supply lines, and for one of them, he sends in Ira Hogaboom, a soldier carrying a flamethrower, to clear a cave out. However, the cave is full of Japanese civilians who are severely burned by the attack and Phelps orders his unit to finish them off to end their suffering, but Sheldon shoots Phelps in the back out of disgust, leading Phelps to be medically discharged and sent back home. It's possible that Phelps sees his crusade as a detective as a way to redeem himself for his mistakes during the war, or as a way to move past them and be recognized for something better. That may explain why Phelps tries so hard to stay on the right side of the law as a police officer, and perhaps what inevitably leads to his downfall. Phelps' big assignment on the vice desk is the SS Coolridge heist, where a large amount of military supplies were stolen from a cargo ship, including a mountain of army surplus morphine which soon floods the streets of LA. Newspapers and flashbacks reveal that many of the soldiers in Phelps' unit were responsible for the theft to get a fairer reward for their service, spearheaded by Courtney Sheldon, who began supplying the morphine to the mob, specifically real-life LA gangster Mickey Cohen. Once in the mob's hands, morphine deaths begin to skyrocket, with Sheldon attempting to break off their deal in response, which only prompts anger from Cohen, who orders a hit out on the soldiers. Phelps arrives at numerous spots around the city where hitmen are attacking a veteran who is in on the heist, but often Phelps arrives too late to save them, instead having to pick up the trail from evidence left by the perpetrators which leads him to Kelso and Sheldon. Kelso has no involvement and is still bitter with Phelps about the war, but when interviewing Sheldon, Phelps is about to break the case wide open when a bombshell is dropped on him. Earlier in this case, players take control of Phelps off-duty, tailing Elsa Lichtman, a German jazz singer at the Blue Room whom Earl introduced him to in traffic and whom Phelps frequently watches perform live. While it initially seems like Phelps is tailing her to interrogate her about the morphine, the two actually begin an affair, which is witnessed by Earl. Later on, we see members of the LAPD and the city government discussing the Brenda Allen scandal, another real-life event centered around sex worker Brenda Allen, who had connections with corrupt cops in the department, notably the Vice Squad. Earl comes forward and reveals that Phelps' adultery will overshadow the Brenda Allen situation if made public, and as such, Phelps is interrupted during his interrogation of Sheldon and told that he's suspended from duty, turning in his badge and being demoted to the arson desk. A lot of criticism of the story centers around Phelps' affair, as many say it comes out of nowhere and goes against Phelps' established character, and I can certainly agree that it isn't integrated very well into the plot. We see scenes earlier of Phelps watching Elsa perform, which hints at a fixation, but otherwise we have no clues about Phelps' interest in her. It doesn't come out of left field per se, but it is an unexpected and frankly jarring move on Phelps' part if you don't see it coming. Now I have no problem with main characters committing acts like this, and it actually makes a lot of sense for this to happen during Vice, since that's when Phelps' battle against corruption is at its highest, making it ironic when he takes the fall for his own misdeeds. In fact, Earl even says to Phelps at one point, Everyone has their vices. Even you, Phelps. So thematically, I can see what they were trying to do, but it doesn't work for me because A, Phelps' flaws weren't leading to this conclusion, and B, the act itself isn't properly contextualized with his character. Phelps is not perfect and made several mistakes that put people's lives in danger and mess them up, and that is where he's seeking redemption. Not having enough self-control wasn't Phelps' problem, it was trying to exert too much control over those around him, and there's no indication that he was weak-willed to the point of wanting to commit adultery. And on that point, what in Phelps' family life motivated his decision? We know that Phelps is married with two daughters at home, but before Phelps' cheating is made public, we never have a scene with his wife Marie outside of a quick cameo in the intro. 
For someone who's otherwise in a healthy mental state like Phelps, the choice to cheat on a partner isn't done on a whim or without consideration for what their current relationship is like. As far as we know, Phelps and Marie are happily married, so why would Phelps decide to look for love somewhere else? It almost feels to me like McNamara needed a reason for Phelps to stoop to a low point but couldn't make it fit naturally in the context of the narrative, and it unfortunately left a lot of players feeling betrayed by Phelps. But even when he's down and out, Phelps' instincts don't go away as he investigates the main antagonist, the Suburban Redevelopment Fund. This is a funding program allegedly designed to raise money for housing returning servicemen consisting of many prominent figures in LA, including the mayor, the district attorney, the chief of police, and most notably, the property tycoon Leland Monroe. Suburban's real plans were to embezzle money from the government by building cheap houses in the path of a planned freeway, and when the government purchases the land to build the road, it would pay Suburban more money than the home is worth thanks to fraudulent insurance papers. The syndicate would gain millions of dollars on the deal, with Monroe going so far as to bribe citizens into selling their houses to put up his matchstick homes, and burning the homes of those who refused to cooperate. This came courtesy of an arsonist under the control of Dr. Harlan Fontaine, a psychiatrist who not only takes Courtney Sheldon under his wing, but also illegally supplies drugs to his patients as part of his treatment. Fontaine becomes part of Suburban as a major investor after Sheldon reveals to Fontaine his role in the morphine robbery and Fontaine takes the morphine off his hands and promises to invest it into veterans' homes. But Suburban's plans unravel when Fontaine's arsonist, revealed to be a still-traumatized Ira Hogeboom, begins burning houses without Fontaine's instructions, raising the suspicions of both Phelps and Jack Kelso. Kelso has been an investigator for California Fire and Life, but after learning that his boss, Curtis Benson, is also part of Suburban, and finding out about Monroe's shoddy business practices courtesy of Phelps and Elsa, he finds himself in Suburban's firing line. When the assistant district attorney, a man named Peterson, makes Kelso a DA's investigator, he continues looking into the case, making up with Phelps and confronting Monroe to get information about the arsonist. He then learns from Biggs that the arsonist has killed Fontaine and kidnapped Elsa, and that leads us to the finale. When Kelso learns that Hogaboom is responsible for the fires, he tracks him down to the LA River Tunnels where he meets Phelps as the two enter the sewers to find him and rescue Elsa. After making their way through a wave of corrupt cops and suburban goons, Kelso and Phelps make it to Hogaboom, forcing Phelps to confront his actions during the war that turned Hogaboom insane. Kelso puts Hogaboom out of his misery, and the two help Elsa to escape out of the flooding tunnel, but Phelps isn't able to climb out in time and is killed by the raging current, only muttering a weak goodbye before he dies. At his funeral, Earl delivers a clearly false eulogy, and Peterson sits around Suburban's members, indicating that he helped cover up the scandal and pinned most of the blame on Monroe and Fontaine in exchange for getting the DA's job to avoid a shakeup at the LAPD. It's certainly a tragic note to end the story on, and one that also rubs some people the wrong way, though not on the same level as the adultery. Phelps' death, to some, seems as if he only died to end the game on a typical noir ending, though I don't know if I can agree with that criticism, as I actually don't mind that Cole dies, as I think it's a fitting end to his arc. My problem is how quickly it happens, as you can probably tell by looking at this footage, his death scene is edited very poorly, with a lot of time jumps that make the scene look more confusing than anything. There's also a lot of weird spatial issues too, in many shots it looks like it's impossible for any of them to be able to escape the tunnel, let alone Phelps just standing there not even trying to jump for it. But weird death scene aside, it is a decent, if somewhat sloppy resolution to a game packed with a number of interesting story bits. I apologize for all the summary in this analysis, but that's because so much of the plot requires context that you may not have if you haven't played the game before, and the size of the storyline is impressive to say the least. I'll admit that a sizable amount of the overarching narrative doesn't really hold up under scrutiny, and I actually prefer when the cases don't have anything to do with each other. That, to me, is more immersive as a detective story than the overarching narrative, which often pulled me out because that's where most of the flaws in the story lie. The scale of the narrative is impressive, and I will commend the dialogue and acting that sells the plot even when the writing isn't always up to snuff. And it is at least an entertaining enough story to keep the player invested up to the credits, and you want to see the mystery of how it unfolds. So, where would L.A. Noir go from here? 
While ideas for a sequel were being tossed around, Bondi's separation from Rockstar and Closure shelved these plans, and Rockstar retained the Alain Noir IP when Bondi moved to Kennedy Miller Mitchell. KMM began work on a spiritual successor to L.A. Noir called Horror of the Orient, a game also directed by McNamara that would take place in Shanghai in 1936 and whose controversial title comes from a nickname given to the city at the time because of its corruption. Warner Brothers Interactive was set to publish the game for the PlayStation 4 and Xbox One, but for unknown reasons, they pulled out and rumors began spreading that the Bondi team would be laid off from KMM. Sure enough, those rumors were true, and work on Horror of the Orient ceased around 2013 despite internal interest and external funding. Years later, Rockstar released L.A. Noir VR Case Files, a VR port of seven of L.A. Noir's cases developed by Video Games Deluxe, a studio also formed by Brendan McNamara, as apparently some of the tension between Rockstar and McNamara has subsided. Video Games Deluxe is currently working on a AAA open world VR title for Rockstar, though details on this haven't been made available yet. In many ways, it feels like L.A. Noir's time is over, as Rockstar has more or less pushed to the side in favor of pumping out content for GTA and Red Dead Online, despite promises that it is an important property to them. It just didn't have the staying power to draw in the audiences that GTA and Red Dead Redemption do, and the controversy surrounding its developer can sometimes overshadow it entirely. Even the technological achievements haven't left an impact, as while motion scan seemed like it might initially become the new standard for motion capture, it was ultimately too expensive and impractical to implement, especially as traditional motion capture got better and better. So why even bother talking about L.A. Noir anymore? In my case, it's because this game still holds a special place in my heart. As I said at the top of this video, this was the first M-rated game I ever played alongside Skyrim, and those two games both showed my then 15-year-old mind what it was like to play a game for adults. Not in the sense that GTA is for adults, but in the way that a good film is for adults. People who want to think about the consequences of the actions of the characters, not just watch them doing cool things. If it wasn't for L.A. Noir, I never would have been introduced to the GTA series, nor to Red Dead Redemption, one of my favorite video games of all time, so in that sense, I have to respect the game for it. It's far from perfect, but L.A. Noir is still an engrossing and intriguing game that satisfied me as I looked back on it, even if, just like L.A. itself, the darker and more twisted elements are all the clearer now. The thing. 